The World Tomorrow. Herbert W. Armstrong brings you the plain truth about today's world news and the prophecies of the world tomorrow. Well, greetings, everybody. We're living today in a sick, sick world and a world of extreme confusion. We have confusion in governments, and governments are being overthrown now at the rate of about one every month. You tune into the news, as you will this evening, perhaps, and uh, you'll find civil wars, governments being toppled and overthrown, and others meeting to try to prevent a war, which they probably will not do. Now, the world is filled with religions. In the Eastern uh, or Oriental world, we have Buddhism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Taoism, and Hinduism, and others. Then in the Arab world, we have the religion of Islam, or the Muslim religion, founded by Muhammad, and incidentally not by Ali. And uh, the largest religion of all, however, is Christianity. In the Western world, it dominates rather largely. One peculiar thing, I wonder if you ever thought about it. Why is it that in a certain country, nearly everybody claims one religion? Of course, always there will be a few others. It's not a hundred percent, but the overwhelming majority will have one of those religions. Now, religion is really the worship of God or of the supernatural, and in many cases some of these religions are more properly perhaps called philosophies, because some of them know nothing about any God, and it's merely a philosophy of living and of meditation and of things of that sort. Well, even in the Western world of Christianity, we have a Babylon of religious confusion. There are hundreds of different denominations and sects in the, what is called the Christian religion. There are certain things that they seem to all more or less believe, but many differences in the more minor details. Well, in the Christian world, one church, the largest of all, has one almost general public acceptance of being the original Christian church founded by Jesus Christ. Now, if I ask for proof, and what is the proof, I would be told that that church itself is the proof. What is the authority that determines what is the right and the true religion? or the right and the true church? What is the authority that determines which is the original continuation of the church that Jesus Christ founded in 31 A.D.? Well, that particular church will claim that the church is the authority. It will tell you that the Bible is not, in its own language, a sufficient guide to heaven. But the church is the authority. Well, I have not found the reason so far to accept that, but I want to tell you a little more about that. Now, I was born of uh, substantial parents with uh, an ancestry, a Quaker ancestry. That is, the it's usually called the Friends Church, but most people, I think, call them Quakers. My ancestors came to America from Britain with William Penn, and that was 100 years before there was a United States before the Declaration of Independence and the founding of the United States. So I think you would say that uh, I'm really American. My family been in this country for a long, long time. Also, perhaps I'm British because we came from there 200 years ago. Well, be that as it may, I was brought up in Sunday school, and at age 18, I uh, dropped out of Sunday school and uh, my interest became centered on business. Now, I had taken a course in self-analysis and analysis of the various uh, 
professions and occupations and uh, means of earning a living. And I had found a book in the public library at that time that would take one through a complete self-analysis to see where he would fit and to prevent fitting the proverbial square peg in the round hole. In analyzing myself, it seemed that I fit in the advertising profession. I seem to have a knack of writing. I loved writing. And uh, uh, I, I loved that kind of writing. And you know, in those days, there was no radio, no television. As a matter of fact, television has only come since World War II. I wonder if you realize that. Because I remember seeing a little bit of television at CBS in Hollywood. They were giving a little sample of it during the war, uh, but uh, the public wasn't going to get to see any of it until after the war was over. But uh, it has certainly changed things since. Well, in those days, all advertising was newspaper, magazine, and direct mail. We didn't have radio or television. And at age 18, I consulted with an uncle of mine. He was the leading advertising man in Iowa, and I was born and raised in Iowa, which uh, we Iowans, we Hawkeyes, used to like to claim was the most American state of all the states. Anyway, my uncle was the leading advertising man in the state, and my father's younger brother. So uh, I went to him, and he sort of steered my life there for quite a while. Now the question was, if I'm going to go into advertising, where do I get the preparation? I've written a booklet on the seven laws of success. There are seven laws of success that I have thought of, and I have known many of this world's great and near great. And uh, I tell you, they have had to practice uh, at least six of those seven laws to become great and to become a success. And yet most people don't even know what one single one of those laws is, let alone practice it or apply it, and that's why we have so many failures in the world. I maintain that no one should ever be a failure. There are definite laws. There's a cause for every effect. And uh, if anyone is poor and uh, unsuccessful, you know, some people, have, I've heard people brag, well, we're just poor folks. And uh, such and such is too rich for my blood. And they're, they're bragging. Well, I tried to look at things objectively and as they are, and I didn't want to be prejudiced one way or the other. But uh, I went to my uncle and I said, now, where am I going to get my preparation? Because the first law of success, I will tell you now, is having the right goal. If you don't have a goal, if you're not aiming for something, you're never going to arrive there. You've got to know where you're going. But the second law is preparation for that goal. And most people have never had a goal in the first place. They've never had a purpose in life. And secondly, they have not prepared for that particular purpose. Well, under his advice, I determined that I would study. And he helped me in selecting the right books to study. And of course, I immediately subscribed to Printer's Inc. and to advertising and selling, the leading trade journals at the time in the advertising field. And uh, I studied them diligently. And uh, of course, you get psychology in those, but they're not coming from college professors. They're coming from those who are out in the field gaining it in actual experience. So I came up in that school. Now, as I say, I left church and I interest in religion at about age 18, but I was very disturbingly challenged. I had been successful in business. Success today is measured very largely in what do you have and what did you get. We're in the get principle, and I've said so many times there are the two principles of life. One is get and the other is give. Now, give is really love, which is an outgoing concern for the welfare of others, but it's love, first of all, to God, our Maker, our Creator, in, not only in worship, but in obedience and in reliance and trust, because He is the God who gives. 
And he is the great giver. Very few people know that. They don't realize that all good things really come from God. And, of course, I hadn't learned that yet either at that time. But uh, anyway, I was disturbingly challenged. My wife, after nine years of happy marriage, had taken up with what, in my mind, was religious fanaticism. She had begun keeping the seventh-day Sabbath of all things. Now, to me, that was about as far off as you could get. And, uh, you know, the first thing that came to my mind, the first thought was, well, what do all my business associates and friends say? My wife being a religious fanatic. I thought that was crazy. Well, I had all the arguments, of course, and uh, I said to my wife, well, uh, the Bible says, uh, thou shalt observe Sunday. Oh, she says, well, uh, if you show that to me, I'll go back to Sunday. She says, have you seen that? Well, I said, well, no. I said, you know, I don't know anything about the Bible, and I didn't. I had said at that time, well, I just can't understand the Bible, but I could certainly understand what I read in printer's ink and advertising and selling and, and magazines and books of that sort. But uh, I was just sure. She said, well, how do you know the Bible says thou shalt observe Sunday? I said, because all these churches observe Sunday, and they get their religion out of the Bible, so the Bible has to say that. All these churches can't be wrong. Of course, they disagree on this, that, and the other thing, but outside of just one or two, they all agree on Sunday. They're pretty well agreed on that. And so I was certain that all these churches couldn't be wrong. Well, about the same time, another angered challenge was hurled at me. A sister-in-law, just fresh out of college, had, uh, of course, imbibed the doctrine that is the foundation of most education today, the doctrine of evolution. And uh, now I thought I knew a little something about evolution although I'd never gone into any in-depth study of the subject. But she hurled at me, says, Herbert Armstrong, you are just plain, downright ignorant. Now, I was so conceited. I, I was quite cocky, I think, and conceited in those days. I had a lot of self-confidence. Now, later, I want to tell you right now, I had to get rid of that. And I had to replace that self-confidence with another kind of confidence that I call faith. That's faith in God, confidence in Him, and not in self. But nevertheless, at that time, I had a lot of self-confidence. And uh, that was an insult to me. That really was something I couldn't take. Be called ignorant. And uh, I, I was sure that uh, evolution was not a fact. I didn't believe it, what little I knew about it. I thought I knew quite a little about it. But I was determined now to prove both my wife and sister-in-law were wrong. Now, it just happened to come at a time when I had a lot of time on my hands. In fact, practically all of the time. I had one advertising client, a fairly large one at that time. We were up in the Pacific Northwest at this time in uh, Portland, Oregon. And uh, I had one advertising client, and I had to write one ad a week. It was a pretty good size ad and a good sized client. But uh, it only took me 30 minutes or an hour to wrap that ad out, and, and I had the rest of the time free. So uh, these challenges both focused on a sort of common uh, starting point. It was only a starting point, of course, and that is Genesis in the Bible. Well, of course, I had never studied Genesis in the Bible. In the Sunday school days, I remember I came up from babyhood almost in a Sunday school class as soon as I was old enough to attend one. And uh, we uh, never studied the usual uh, lessons that were printed and given out and that all the other classes did. But we boys growing up and young men up to the age of 18, we just continually, year in and year out, kept studying through the book of Proverbs. We rather liked that. And I, I, I did rather like the book of Proverbs because there was a lot of wisdom. And I had always craved understanding. Now, I never craved wisdom in the sense that Solomon does, and I learned I didn't have any wisdom. But I also learned later on 
that God had said, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, and God will give it. And so later I did, and in my life since, by asking God, he's given me enough wisdom that he prevented me from making any great major mistakes. Usually, my decisions have been correct. They've been wrong in a few cases, but not in a, in a, in a case that has uh, really, uh, to any great extent, hurt the work that I have been finally put in. Well, first, I started not in the Bible at all. I started by getting all of the books on evolution. So I got the works of Darwin and uh, of Lyell and of Haeckel and Huxley and Spencer and Vogt of Chamberlain. And uh, even back before that time, Lamarck and his theory of use and disuse, and they discarded that and took up Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest. And I think they're more or less clinging to that still, although mutations and other theories have come along since. But uh, also I studied a book by a scientist by the name of Moore. Now, I like Moore because he could take a lot of cracks at evolution, although in general he accepted it in general himself, but he, he knew a lot of things wrong with it. Anyway, I thoroughly studied those things, and uh, I found that the first thing I knew, I was beginning to doubt whether there is any such thing as God, because I learned that evolution is simply an atheist's explanation of the presence of a creation which we see about us, and uh, creation and life and different kinds of life and all that sort of thing. The presence of this creation without the pre-existence of a creator. In other words, evolution says it all just happened by natural laws and resident forces and not by any mind that thought it out and planned it and directed it at all, but it just came naturally that way. In other words, your mind just came from nothing and uh, uh, your mind is uh, greater than anything you can conceive of, but they seem to think that your mind was designed and, and came about by something less than your mind, and I couldn't quite stomach that. I never, never could accept that. But anyway, I was really shaken up quite a little for a while. I said, well, now, I've always believed in God, and I began to realize that... Uh, I had just accepted it because I'd been taught it, and my family all, always believed it. The church I'd been taken to believed that there is a God, and I, I, I just took it for granted. Do you know I learned that nearly everybody just assumes that there either is a God or some atheists assume that there isn't, but no proof. They've never investigated it. They have never gone in to find out for sure. I wanted to prove it. I wanted to know now. I was really shaken. But I was honest, and my mind was, well, it was open, yes. In a way, I was prejudiced, and I wanted to uh, come out to a certain end, and uh, maybe I used a little inductive reasoning to the extent that I tried to prove my own point, but in many cases, uh, instead of proving that, I proved just the opposite. And uh, then I had to swallow that. But uh, the arguments of all of these uh, authors of uh, the theory of evolution are very convincing. And I was shaken, as I say, I, I wondered, is there a God? Now I said, I've got to know, but I'm not going to take it for granted any longer. I'm not going to just carelessly assume because I've been taught it. I want proof. I want to know. So my first object was to prove or disprove, whichever, the existence of God. Now, it was a thorough, in-depth study and research, and that first stage of it lasted for six months, from the autumn of 1927 until the spring of 1928. Well, suffice it to say now, without going into a lot of detail, because I'd keep you here all night and all day tomorrow and the next two or three days, if I go into the detail of everything I went through, and I won't bore you with that. But uh, suffice it to say now that I wound up proving the existence of God 
to my own mind, absolute proof. And I proved the fallacy of evolution. Now, I had the satisfaction of going to one who had been in evolution and had done a, a great deal of graduate work in uh, the University of Chicago and at Columbia University and other such universities with, uh, I think, at least two Ph.D. degrees and uh, who was uh, thoroughly wedded to evolution. And I wrote a paper. It was not too long. You could have read it in, uh, oh, between five and ten minutes. Disproving evolution. Now, this happened to be a woman. As a matter of fact, she was, at that time, the manager or head of the uh, science department of the public library in Portland, Oregon. But she was a very scholarly woman. After I left that with her, I came back the next day, and I said, now what about it? Well, she shook her head. She says, Mr. Armstrong, you have an uncanny knack of going right to the trunk of the tree, right to the center of the thing, and if you chop down the trunk, all the branches fall down with it. She says, I've got to admit you have absolutely disproved evolution. And even though I know you disproved it, I can't give it up. I'm so thoroughly steeped in it. I've believed it all my life. I've been educated in it. And uh, I would just lose my bearings. I wouldn't know what to do if I'd tried to give it up. I've got to go on believing it, even though you've proved to me it's a lie and it is not the truth. Well, I at least had the satisfaction of having proved it. Now, I did have the satisfaction, too, of uh, making the sister-in-law eat her words, so to speak, of what she had said when she called me so ignorant. And uh, I did it with an article that I had written, and I know that she didn't know what she was getting into. She started reading the article, and when she got through, she says, Herbert Armstrong, that's a dirty trick. I didn't know what I was getting into. I said, but you do know now that I was not ignorant and evolution is not proved. Well, she had to admit it. But uh, anyway, as I say, uh, I think Moore, uh, Professor Moore, uh, helped me to understand that. While he was an evolutionist, he could really point out a good many things that were wrong with it. But uh, I finally came to the point where I had to, as they say, eat crow. I had to admit my wife was right, and I was wrong. And uh, uh, suffice it to say now that I proved the existence of God, I proved the fallacy of evolution, and next, all religions have their various sacred writings, you know. Now, the Bible is merely the uh, sacred writings of the Christian religion, but the other religions have their sacred writings, too. And I decided that I would delve into all of those, but I said I will take the Bible first because that is the one believed in here. Now I made a thorough study of the Bible. And again, I'm not going to go into the details of it, because I do that in many, many of these uh, programs and give you various phases of it, and I can't give it to all to you in this one. But the result is I proved the absolute authority of the Bible as a revealed word of God in its original writings. Now, I might explain to you that uh, the Old Testament was nearly all of it written in the Hebrew language, some of it in the Aramaic, but uh, all of the New Testament originally was written in the Greek language. There wasn't any English language in those days. I'm speaking in the English language, but I find wherever I go in the world now that English has become more or less of a world language, and I can be understood. Now, remember, they didn't have printing until long. When was it? Well, about 400 years ago or so. But uh, before that, all writing had to be done by hand. And uh, there are thousands and thousands of copies that have been so carefully copied. And uh, if uh, one of them is different and the other will say 999 uh, are all together, you can uh, pretty well prove it. But you prove any one passage pretty well by how it uh, compares with others. Because I found, I looked at all of the supposed contradictions in the Bible. And you know, they all just dissolved and melted. And there, there was no contradiction at all when I analyzed it carefully.
But there are the so-called contradictions. Don't let it fool you. Write in any contradiction. We'll give you an explanation without any charge and be very happy to do it. However, you can understand the exact truth of the Bible. Let me just say that, even though we have different English translations. Now, the result of that is that I finally proved, before I even got to the others, I proved the absolute authenticity and the divine authority of the Bible. Now, that became my authority. And I couldn't accept the authority of some one church misclaiming it as the number one church. I had to go by what had been proved to me to be the exact inspired word of the living God. I proved that God lives, that God is the creator, and uh, uh, that he is the, the great designer, the creator. And so now, let me just say that I have a booklet here, Does God Exist? I'd like to send that to you, and there's no charge at all. And uh, there are two sections of it. One is, uh, let me just read a little of it to you. Can the existence of God be scientifically proved? Where did the first life come from? Can we know whether God possesses mind power? Then some of the subheadings, I question God's existence. And secondly, uh, don't assume, no, be sure. Uh, next, I found proof. Then next, which God? One atheist said, well, there are all kinds of gods in the world, and, and uh, this and that and the other. And he said to me, now, which God do you believe? The result is I wound up making him admit that God exists, and I told him what God I believed in, and he said, well, I will never accept that God of yours, even though you make me uh, believe that he does exist. Well, of course, he can live with that if he wants to. Next, creation without a creator. And the uh, next subheading, uh, amazing new knowledge of science. And uh, the next is the question, has matter always existed? I found that science proves matter has not always existed. There was a time when it came into existence. And uh, the next subheading, when matter did not exist. And then, uh, where did life come from? And then next, life only from life, and that is a scientific uh, law. And uh, uh, next is anything superior to your mind. Yes, I'll tell you there is, and that's the mind of God. But I don't know of anything else superior to my mind. Now, maybe the mind of angels is superior, but uh, you see, angels are invisible to us, and we don't know too much about them except what's revealed in the Bible. Then the supreme intelligence, and uh, suppose you were a creator, is another section. What could you do with your mind? Could you match anything like what has been created? And that's a proof that the mind that did the creating is certainly superior to your mind. You couldn't have done it. Then the miracle of living food, and uh, uh, man's intelligence versus God's, and causes of diseases. And uh, uh, then follows another section on seven proofs that God exists, seven scientific proofs. Now, if you have never proved it, you should. Don't go on just assuming that either God does or does not exist, but get the proof. Be sure you know that you have a solid foundation under you, and I'm glad to offer you this booklet. No charge, just does God exist, and you just address me as Herbert W. Armstrong, Pasadena, California. So until next time. This is Herbert W. Armstrong, the only address you need, Pasadena, California. Booklets are free. We have nothing to sell. Until next time, goodbye. You have heard The World Tomorrow with Herbert W. Armstrong. For literature offered on this program, send your requests along with the call letters of this station to Herbert W. Armstrong. Additional programs and literature available at hwalibrary.com.